Okay, is that recording? Yes, it is recording now. Okay. Just to give you a heads up in case you want to keep your camera off uh, or keep yourself muted if you don't want to uh, to appear in the recording. And I will turn on the live captions as well. A nice little digital accessibility feature here in Teams. Might not be 100% accurate with the automatic speech to text, but it's looking pretty good there. And how many have we got logged in so far? OK, we've got 16 people here so far. We might get a few more come in yet. Uh, for those who just joined, you'll notice I put a link in the chat box to the Google Classroom we're going to be using for today as well as uh, join code. So if you uh, want to join there, uh, then you can uh, easily access some of the resources for some of our interactive activities, and I'll be presenting from that. Um, and I've got some stuff loaded here in Teams as well that we'll take advantage of a little later on. So first of all, welcome to everybody to our uh, brunch and learn session. Uh, Regret that we couldn't meet in person for this. Couldn't guarantee that we could uh, get ourselves a room with enough space, depending on the number of people who joined us for today's session. But uh, personally, I think that given our topic for today, this works just as well, if not better, because there's a good chance that at some point, some of you will have to uh, use online technologies to teach your students if um, the pandemic persists, if we end up having uh, school closures or anything like that, or some other event happens where we have to end up teaching remotely, then this is a good chance for you to get a little bit familiar with uh, some of the technologies that are going to be used. So for those of you who haven't met me, uh, who I didn't have the opportunity to meet during your initial interviews and who um, were not in 4108 this term, I'm Rob Power and I am an assistant professor with the uh, School of Education and Technology and uh, my area of specialization is in instructional design for educational technology integration and for online and blended learning, as well as for using mobile technologies in education. So uh, I'm pleased that I have this opportunity to reach out to a wider audience beyond just uh, the participants in 4108 this term. And hopefully we'll be able to get this regularly scheduled for future cohorts as part of the professionalism series. I'll talk to uh, to uh, my colleagues about getting that uh, put on the agenda for future years so that everybody has a chance to take advantage of something like this. I'm going to start us off with uh, with a land acknowledgement and then we'll dive right into some of the resources for today. So I would like to acknowledge that uh, here at Cape Breton University, we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded, uh, unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. And uh, as part of my acknowledgement and to be as inclusive as possible, I just realized as I was reading that out uh, that um, I still included the word Maliseet in there and I only learned a couple of days ago that Maliseet may not be the appropriate term to use. Uh, in this land acknowledgement, so I do apologize about that. I will uh, seek further clarification as to what the correct term for our land acknowledgements should be instead of Maliseet. Uh, I see Hannah's asking if everyone can access the Google Classroom. You should be able to, but you cannot access it if you are using your Genes Google account. You need to use a private Google account because that classroom is not on the uh, Genes server. And for privacy and security reasons, they don't allow you to use a private Google account to access Genes. 
Google Classrooms, and conversely, they don't allow you to use Genus accounts to access a private Google Classroom. That's just to make sure that our K-12 students um, have uh, some security and some privacy when they're in their classrooms and they don't inadvertently get directed to uh, to a space that's not secure. And uh, for a little bit of technical information on how that works, while Genesis Google Classrooms and Google Suite applications are the Google applications, uh, the provincial government has a license with Google for Google Classroom and associated applications and they have their own private domain for that where they control the servers and they control the data. So there's no cross traffic back and forth between private Google accounts and the Genius ones. And that's to make sure that we're protecting our students' privacy. So you need to use a private Google account if you want to log into that Google Classroom. All right, uh, I'm going to stop presenting this slideshow. And I'm going to get right into the Google Classroom here now. By the way, before I start doing that, a couple of, couple of little tips for those who haven't participated in online classes before. And I'll see, I see that there's at least a hand, uh, one hand raised there. So I will tackle your question in just a moment. If you've never done an online class before, I strongly recommend that uh, before it's your turn to lead one, you get yourself a good headset mic to use uh, while you're participating in these types of classes. Typically, uh, your laptop computer will have a mic and a camera and all of that built in. The problem is that the mic itself on your laptop is close to the speakers, so you end up getting uh, a lot of feedback and uh, you might get an echoey effect. Also, um, when you're using a headset, it's less distracting for those around you if you're not in a private area. And a headset mic is uh, unidirectional. It only picks up the sound that's directly in front of the mic, whereas the one on your laptop is what we call omnidirectional. It picks up the whole room. So if you have kids around you or barking dogs or you're not in a private location, it's going to pick up a lot more noise and be a lot more difficult to hear you. So a good headset mic cuts down on some of that background noise. It also gives you a little bit more ability to focus on what's going on because you've got the headset on, so you're not hearing everything that's going on around you. So a little quick pro tip there. Another pro tip, make sure that uh, you don't have anything extra open on your computer that you wouldn't want anyone else to see because if you end up sharing your screen, then you may end up uh, displaying some private information like grading, uh, grading worksheets or student assignments or your emails or even, heaven forbid, something that uh, would be NSFW and that you don't want caught on camera or recorded. Uh, and likewise, if you wear glasses like I do, be cognizant that your glasses will reflect your screen. So if you're surfing around and not fully paying attention to the meeting, uh, even if you're not sharing your screen, others might see what you're up to. So uh, keep that in mind and you may want to consider taking your glasses off if they're reflecting your screen. Now, let me see who's got their hands up before we get into this. Chelsea, go ahead with your question. Um, yeah, I can't seem to see the chat box, but some way this answered my question. They say, so for everyone else, just go into Teams and go join or create a team and add a join co uh, code that's in the yep. email. And I'm just going to do that, see if I can get the chat box in. Okay, yeah, you can uh, definitely do that. And uh, also in the email that was sent out, there was a link to the Google Classroom and the join code for the Google Classroom was in that email as well. And don't worry if you can't get in right away, if it takes you a little while to get in or if you can't get in at all, uh, we're going to uh, be presenting the stuff on the screen. Just might limit some of your ability to take part in some of the interactive elements that we have here. So I will share my screen and bring up the Google Classroom. So this is our Google Classroom our November brunch and learn. Too bad we couldn't meet in person. We couldn't actually have some brunch provided for this. I decided to use Google Classroom to share these resources today rather than just putting everything in Teams because 
a lot of you will be using Google Classroom with your students uh, this coming term on your practicum or when you take on your own teaching positions. So I figured it would be the best way to uh, help you get your feet wet and learn your way around it. And Google Classroom is actually one of the topics we're going to be looking at here this morning. When you get into a Google Classroom, the first thing you see is the stream. I find the stream can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, you may want to tweak some of your settings in there. I don't know exactly where the option is right now, but uh, I found that when my kids last year were using Google Classroom for their remote learning, they were getting an email every single time a new message was posting up in the stream. So they were getting all the messages twice. Their, their devices were going crazy with notifications. You can turn that off so you don't get a notification every time something is posted in the stream. But the area that you would want to focus on is the classwork area. This is where students would go to find all of their activities and uh, to be able to access the resources that they need. So you can see today we're going to be looking at some basics of Google Classroom. We're going to look at uh, some basics of Google Docs, uh, Kahoot, Nearpod, Padlet, and I have got a presentation as well on some basic things that you can do to make sure that you're complying with digital accessibility standards. And uh, I've also been asked to show you a little bit about some tools like Google Read and Write or the uh, speech to text capabilities in Microsoft Word. So I will do my best to show you a little bit about that as well. Uh, there's a lot that we have here, so hopefully we have enough time to get through it all. And I would like to send a shout out and a special thank you to uh, the participants from EDUC 4108 who have helped me to prepare these materials for today. Um, a lot of these resources are based on apps and tools that they've been looking at throughout the term. And they do have to keep a portfolio as part of the course of uh, their explorations of different educational technologies throughout the term. One of the requirements of that assignment was that in the final week of the course, next week on Monday morning, they were all supposed to come in, pick one of the tools that they reviewed in their portfolio and do a short presentation to the class about that tool. So I gave them the option a few weeks back of creating a presentation and some resources for use as part of this uh, professional development session in lieu of presenting in class on Monday. And I would like to give that shout out to them for stepping up to the plate and for really helping to pull all of this together. So I'm going to lead the session on Google Classroom Basics and as well on Digital Accessibility Basics. I'll facilitate the other sessions, run the materials uh, for you, the presentations for you, because uh, most of those uh, 4108 students couldn't be here this morning. They have another class and I didn't want to uh, steal them from one of their other core classes uh, to uh, to participate in this, but they did pre-record some materials uh, in some cases and in other cases they curated some useful presentation materials for you. Any questions before we get started? All right, I'll dive right into uh, the Google Classroom basics then. And like I said, don't worry if you can't get into the Google Classroom right away. Uh, you can keep trying and uh, you will be able to see the presentation from here. And you should be able to partic participate in some of the um, some of the activities, even if you can't get into Google Classroom. But the nice thing is if you get into the Google Classroom, you can access these resources after the fact. So those who are watching this recording, those who couldn't be here today, you can get in here after the fact. And most of the interactive materials, there is a version uh, provided where you can go through it at your own pace later on. So our first session here is on Google Classroom Basics. And I have a little overview here for you, a couple of videos that I have found that I'm going to play for you. So you don't have to listen to me for uh, for two straight hours. Another pro tip for you, by the way, if you're leading a live online class, you don't need to lecture and you don't need to speak for the whole two hours uh, or for however long it is. No one wants to listen to you anyway uh, for, for that amount of time. I know that they don't want to listen to me for that whole amount of time. Um, 
you can bring in some extra materials and it's a good idea to uh, to incorporate as many interactive activities as possible and get your participants actually doing something rather than wasting your precious time in a live session presenting new material use that time to interact with your students and to get them doing something because you can always find pre-recorded resources for the presentation of new material. So I've got a couple of quick videos here on introduction to Google Suite for Education and then I've got a little game for us uh, to help you see or to help me see how much of this uh, content you've absorbed and uh, whether or not you've got the gist of Google Classroom. So I'll start with the first video here and please somebody grab the mic and give me a shout if you can't hear the audio while I'm playing this. Rob, I'm not able to hear it. You're not able to hear. OK, let me stop my sharing. I believe I forgot one option on here. Share screen. Uh, OK, and. Ah, include my computer sound. There we go. You always need to make sure you include your computer sound. All right, so I'll restart that. Some nice happy music with that one, wasn't there? OK, and this one is a little bit longer, but gives you a little bit more detail about how to work with Google Classroom. Welcome to this introduction to G Suite for Education. In September 2016, Google changed what was Google Apps for Education to G Suite for Education. So now we're just going to have a look at what that means. Although the names changed, the core services haven't and as you can see all the same services are available as were previously available with Google Apps for Education. The reasons to use G Suite for Education are below. First is it's completely free that means there's no costs and no ads. The second is the easy collaboration. With all these Google services together it means you can create, share and edit files in real time so everyone's on the same page and everything is also stored in the cloud, giving you great access. And that leads us on to the third thing. You can use it on any device, whether it's your laptop, a PC, a Mac, or a Chromebook, whether it's your smartphone or your tablet. Whatever device you've got, if you're connected to the internet, you can access the Google products and services. So let's have a look at how these services will impact your school. The first is Gmail, bringing Gmail to your school. And that may be a product many people are familiar with. 
and it's a great way of just building your network and communicating effectively with some great tools. And collaborating on Docs with Google Docs, Sheets and Slides, you can create really impressive and professional looking documents and presentations that will aid you in your work. You can share calendars so you can keep on top of what you're doing and connecting together with other people. Streamlining your class with Google Classroom, a great digital classroom where you can upload work, make assignments and manage your classroom on a digital platform. With Google Hangouts, you can meet face to face, video conferencing, but also chatting. And even now with Google Hangouts on air, broadcasting. You can create websites with Google Sites. They've just had a recent update and it's really professional. And you can make your portfolios or students can save work to their websites and learn key skills. But most of all, you can also share all this in the cloud with Google Drive. And this is where it brings it all together, linking everything. But that's not all, there's more. Google are constantly improving products all the time. That means that as users recommend things or problems occur, Google are always updating and adding new features to the products. And these just come in seamlessly and update themselves without you having to do updates. There's also new products such as Google Ex Expeditions, which is a virtual reality look around the world. And this is being rolled out in many classrooms now. But it also connects with other popular Google products, such as Google Chrome, Google Search, Maps, or Scholar. Also with YouTube. And so there's so many different things you can connect with in the Google community. So that was your quick introduction to Google Suite for Education. We really hope that you enjoy using it now in your school. Okay, so a little bit about Google Classroom there, and I've got a game ready for you now to sort of uh, tie this together. And uh, it's Kahoot. So there's a link here for you to uh, to get to Kahoot. Uh, it's uh, if you don't uh, see the link, you can't uh, get into the Google Classroom. It's just Kahoot.it. I'll give you all a chance to get there. And I am going to go into Kahoot myself and I'm going to uh, to launch that game. Uh, need to uh, get another browser tab open here. And you'll learn a little bit more about Kahoot later on in the session. One of our groups has prepared a presentation on that, so I'm just going to log into my teacher account for it. I'm in here now. And my Kahoots. And I'm going to play this one. And if you want to play it live, you uh, click on the teach. If you want to assign it to your students to work on their own time, you can click on assign. I'm going to go to the teach option now and player versus player. So you'll all be able to uh, compete against each other. You can use your phones to do this. So you can use a second screen. You're going to want to keep uh, your main screen for the presentation open so you can see the questions uh, that I'm sharing while you answer the questions on your device. Kind of like scene play at the movie theater. So it's going to generate this pin code here. You go to Kahoot.it or use the Kahoot app and you put in that pin code. And once we get people logged in here, then I'll launch the questions. I could talk all about the benefits of using Kahoot uh, in your classes, but I w don't want to steal the thunder from my group who's presenting on that later.
another couple of seconds for uh, everyone to get joined in. We've got 12 signed up so far. Doesn't look like that number is climbing, so I'll start the game in three, two, and one. The pin code is there, by the way, if you're still trying to get in, you can still join. That's correct. Google Chrome is the best, uh, the best browser to use with Google applications, including Google Classroom. Some of the functionality may not work in other browsers. And we've got Tanya in the lead. Rob, oh, sorry. So when logging into a Nova Scotia Google Classroom, what must you use? And I'll get your question now in a moment once uh, this one is over. That's correct. You, when using a Nova Scotia Google Classroom, you must use your GNS account. You can't get into a, 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 a provincial school's Google Classroom with a personal Gmail account. And who had a question before we move on to the next uh, question in this quiz? It was me, Betty, but I figured it out. I didn't realize I had to toggle between both screens. Ah, uh, yeah, this is where your phone comes in handy if you want to get into here using your phone. Yeah, it's different. Or like me, if you have multiple screens uh, set up for your computer. By the way, if you are teaching online, I highly recommend getting a second monitor. <laughs> it's so useful. All right, let's move on. Tanya still in the lead. Way to go, Tanya. Couple catching up to you though. That's right. You would find the announcements would show up in the stream. The classwork is where your instructor, your teacher would post your assignments and uh, return your grades and post materials. But the stream is like the chat area that shows you all the recent activity and all the announcements uh, that your teacher would post. Tanya, you're still in the lead, but Jess is catching up fast and so is Renee. What are the ways to find out if you have work and what it is? Yeah, the correct answer is all of those. All of those are different ways where you can find out what work you have to do. Tanya, you're still in the lead. And Jill is catching up quickly. Teachers can attach docs, sheets, slides, automatically make a copy for you to edit. True or false? Absolutely true. One of the cool features of Google Classroom. I can make one document, the template that I want everyone to work on, and then make a copy for each individual student. Tanya's holding on strong, but Brittany is on fire and starting to catch up. You can add or create the following on any assignment.
That's right. You can add all of those things into assignments for students to turn in. And now Tanya's on fire with six correct answers in a row, but Chris and Brittany are catching up quickly and Jess is just right on your tail. I think Tanya must have some uh, experience with Google Classroom. Both are correct. If you unsubmit, then you can edit. Uh, or you have to wait until your teacher returns it uh, in order for you to edit it. But you can unsubmit. Tanya's still in the lead. Jess is right on your tail. Streak of seven. And our final question. When using Google Classroom, teachers have access to student work. That's correct. Anytime on any device. And let's see who our final winner is. Number three is Brittany. At number two, we have Jess. And at number one, we have, drum roll, Tanya. Tanya, I think you must have some experience using Google Classroom. All right. Let's get back into our Google Classroom here. So I had a couple of other resources here. One is a question about how well you know Google Classroom. It's a copy of this Kahoot game. You can play it again at your own pace, especially useful for those of you watching the recording if you want to go through that Kahoot on your own. And then I just had a quick question here. I, I created a little assignment for you. You can answer this on your own time later on. Yes or no, have you ever used Google Classroom before? And then you can see uh, how many people have turned this in? I, I could see that and I could mark that as complete for you. So you can do that on your own time. I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit more about Google Docs. And this session, this part of the presentation is brought to you by Courtney, Ireland, Nicole, and Jocelyn from 4108. A little presentation about some various Google apps that you could use with your Google Classroom or outside of Google Classroom in your own class. So they have an overview presentation here. I'll play that for you. And uh, then they have a couple of examples. Hi everyone. So I'm gonna explain to you here what Google Jamboard is. And I thought the best way to do that would to actually make a Jamboard here to show you. So here I found a really great video. It explains all of it, great tools to it, and the basics. It's about like 25 minutes or so, so we're not really going to watch it, but we'll have the link available. So what exactly is Jamboard? Uh, it's this online whiteboard that allows you and your students to interact with it together. So it's used through Google, it's very easily shared, and then multiple people can kind of edit it at once. You can also share it through like if you had a classroom or um, if you're on the Microsoft Teams again, you just send the link. Um, so you can use it for any questions or problems you want students to work through, or you can use it kind of as that hook to your lesson plan. And there are options to kind of change the layout to it um, if you wanted things to be like grid paper for questions and so. So as you can see right here at the top, you can kind of just keep adding pages as you go. So we'll just start here on a blank one to explain everything. Um, so here's your pen, you can draw, you can change the color of it, size, you know, like anything good, eraser, um, this just gets you back to your regular 
arrow sticky notes kind of the same idea when you do microsoft uh, teams colors you type a little thing save it and then you can kind of move around there um images so you can kind of add any images there you want google from you can google search it which is great right there and then um, insert it text box like any good text box oh um here's shapes if you want to add in any kind of shapes you know when you're explaining things if you wanted to use it for let's say math and like building blocks and so you can just kind of change the colors there transparent all that kind of stuff and then this one here is a laser so if you were to say explaining something if you're you can kind of be like you know this is where i'm at especially if you were on like in person or even you're just on the microsoft teams and you're not really face to face so you can kind of show them where you're at with the laser pointer there you can clear the frame and like i was saying here you can set to grid line papers boxes and all that kind of stuff you can even set an image like i said before put it in there um so you can add as many as you want and then when you go through here you have them all listed and if you didn't want one or something like that you just simply press and delete it and then you x out of there so you share it here through here and um, and then this is how you want to present it here's like a meeting code and such uh you can rename it you can even download it just as a pdf and share it make copies so that's how when you add it into different files and such share it here you can share both of the emails copy just the regular link and so it's actually a really great tool to use especially in classes if you just have questions and you want everyone to just to type on here or insert something for it so it's really a great tool to use for that hello everyone so today i'm just going to talk to you a bit about google docs briefly and i'm sure we've all seen google docs used before or you've used it personally but i'm just going to give a quick rundown on how to use it so google docs is an online word processor that lets you create and format documents and one thing that's really special about google docs is it lets you work and collaborate with other people very easily so i'm just going to show you how to create a doc and how to share it so to create the doc you hit blank document and you can rename it so i'm just going to test Name this one as a test one. All right, so you can see here, I put my email in here and then you can add a message if you'd like. And I always like to have it as notifying and then you can change them if they want to only be a viewer so they can only see the document, if they can comment on it or if they can edit it and normally if you're working together, you'd have it as editor, but if you just wanted someone to comment on it, then it was just a commenter. So you can send that and that will go to their Gmail. And then all they have to do is click the link and it will be there, which is really simple. So then if we go back here, I have a Google Docs already made. So why use Google Docs? It's easy and free to use. You can use the app on any device wherever you are with or without Wi-Fi. You can search Google without leaving your document, which is really great. You can look up words you don't know or synonyms to replace overused words, which is really helpful, especially with high school and elementary students. And you, it is a file sharing as an editor and makes everything easier. So some simple ways to use it in the classroom are um, in the classroom settings, students can work together on a project on the same document simultaneously, as well as students and teachers are able to see who wrote what and who made edits, which is great. And then the second idea is teachers are able to provide feedback to help students. For example, in a social studies class, teachers could check docs and guide students to give feedback on a final project, such as a social action project. And teachers are able to give and provide an easily access feedback and suggestions on an assignment after passing it in with comments tool. So I'm just going to show you guys how to add that comment and edit tool in. So you can just highlight whatever you'd like to comment and then insert. And then you come down here. And you add the comments so you could put a great job. Or anything. So then it would be there and you can see the time and the date. And then I just put some videos down here to help you 
if you need some more help with Google Docs going through how to create them and share them again in more detail. And we will have those links provided to you. And then I found this great resource provided by Google, um, provided by Google, and it's a Google Docs cheat sheet. So it just shows you how to copy the form, copy, paste, change the alignments, work with different versions of your uh, document, enhance your document by adding features, so like images and the um, accessibility descriptions, tables, drawing links, charts, bookmarks, etc. So yeah, overall, I definitely suggest using Google Docs in your classroom and even your daily life. It's a great tool for collaboration and inclusive education. Hey everyone, my name's Ireland and I'm going to be doing a really basic introduction into using Google Sheets. So the nice thing about Google Sheets is that it's quite similar to the Microsoft Excel application. So if you've used that before and you're kind of familiar with it, Google Sheets isn't going to be all that new and you'll figure it out pretty easily if you can kind of pick up on the similarities. There are a few differences, but overall the applications kind of serve the same purpose, same function, that kind of idea. It's a great organizational tool to use and it helps you kind of record and manage any kind of data that you want to keep track of. The nice thing about Google Sheets, though, is that it is a highly collaborative application and it makes working together with other people so much easier. Google Sheets just kind of lets you um, send it to other people and kind of work together in real time rather than waiting for other people to do their part. And then it's also um, directly related to like Google Classroom and all the other Google applications. So you can kind of cross the boundary of the different applications very easily without having to worry about like transitional issues and things like that. So Google Sheets is something that you can access directly from your Google account. And you would find it just by looking for this little green icon that you can see in the top corner here. And when you click on that, it'll take you to this page here, which will show you every Google Sheet that you've kind of created down in the section here. And then it'll provide you with some templates. And then it'll also give you the option to create a blank sheet, which is what we're going to do today. So we're going to click on this little plus sign. And so then it'll take you to this a spreadsheet here. And we can see it's broken down into columns and rows where your columns are alphabetically kind of distinguished. And then your rows are all numbered for what, however many you're ever going to need kind of deal. And then we also have the chance to title our spreadsheet. So just for this one, to show you how to do it, you want to click on this little box and then you can add your title in. So I'm going to go tech Google Sheets video. And so that's kind of my title so I can keep track of what it is. It's very easy to find. I can search it up pretty quickly. And then down here, you see where they have sheet one. If you click on that, you're actually able to rename this and I'm going to name mine video demo data. And this is really helpful because you can actually add other sheets down here with this little plus button. And so you can have multiple sheets in one file. So it's kind of easy to keep track of your data and where it's moving between. So in here we have our columns and rows, and this is kind of what you're going to work with to organize any data that you want to put in. So for this example, I'm going to keep it pretty simple and we'll just use some different data that we could use as teachers in the classroom that we may want to keep track of. So for our first column, we'll call it the student name column, and we can just throw in, we can leave, go to the next block down, so the second row, and then from there we can start entering our student names. So we'll just make some up, and we'll say we have a Jane, an Alex, a Michael, um, we can have an Anna as well. And so then from here, we can go and we'll say student ID number if we wanted to. And so we can say just one, two, three, four, five, six for this one, seven, eight, nine, and then we'll just three, two, one. And that is just kind of an identification data that we can use. And there's a multiple different uses you can use Google Sheets for in your classroom data management. Um, it all depends on your style as a teacher and what you kind of want to keep track of and if Sheets work for you. But overall, it's a great organizational tool. And as long as you think about how you want to organize things, you can basically use it for almost anything. Um, I've included a couple extra links that kind of go further into the different tips and tools you can use within the application, as well as like just relation to what you can do with it in teaching. So there's some examples as far as like field trip guides and things like that. Um, 
So yeah, let's say we want to use this as like a grade book. So we can do test one score, test two score, test three score. And so we'll just add in some random numbers here and you can add in marks for each student. And we'll say, get these going in here. And I'm just gonna add the other ones into each column. It's the same idea, um, but you just wanna kind of add them all in. So I'm just gonna skip through and do that quickly. So now that we have those other scores in there, another organizational thing you can do on sheets is you can actually categorize everything, just kind of distinguish it by color. So there's a little button here, it's called the fill color button, and you can just kind of select something that differentiates each column. So you can kind of keep everything a little bit organized here. So as you can see, I'm just assigning different colors to each section, just so that you can kind of, it's easier on your eyes and easier to follow through. So you can do it in this way just to help yourself keep track of things. And when you're working with it, you can see kind of which column is which and things like that. So we'll do the last one here and we'll go with a pink. <laughs> and so from there, there's a bunch of different functions that you can actually use. Um, for this one, I'm just going to keep it simple for the sake of time. So if you wanted to find, say, the average of all of the test scores, you can go equals and then if you type in start typing in average that's your number there and then you can select these ones here so actually here we go um i just you have to make sure you're selecting the right columns here so average and then i'm going to do c2 2 three and then bracket that off and then that'll give us our test average and then you can also autofill it so you can do that either by filling the prompt here or you can drag down your bar menu and this is something you can do you can do it for a number of different things you can find like your grade median things like that um but yeah i'll just keep it simple for the sake of time with just doing average so yeah, there's a bunch of different functions and you just kind of type them in with that equal sign and Google Sheets will actually calculate that value for you. So it's going to save you a lot of time in the long run. But yeah, that's my really basic intro to it. It just kind of shows you a couple different ways of data management and what you're going to need to do. And yeah, so if you're interested, you can follow some of the links I provided in the other Google document that has connections to Google Sheets in the classroom, as well as kind of looking more in depth at the program itself and any training opportunities you might want to do with it. So thanks for listening. Hi, everyone. My name is Jocelyn and I'm going to do a little overview of Google Slides and I'm going to show you a fun way that you can use it with your students once we are in the classroom. So to begin, you need a Google account, which is free. And the nice thing about Google Slides is that you can use it right from your web browser. You don't need to download a new software for it. So once you're logged into your Google account, you go up to this Google Apps icon and you can get to Google Slides right from here. However, I'm going to show you how to get there through your drive. Once you're in your drive, you go up to this new button, you go down to Google Slides and you can either do a blank presentation or from a template. I've pre-made a little Google slide for this presentation, so I'm just going to click right into that. So say you started your Google slide, you put in some information and you want to edit the text. All you have to do is highlight what you want to edit and use this toolbar to edit. So you can change the font, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, you can make it bold, italic, you can underline, change the color, and you can um, change the alignment, the indentation, you can make bullet lists and number lists, and then say you don't like your formatting and you want to clear it all, you just hit this button. If you wanted to change your background, all you have to do is make sure the, uh, the slide that you want to change is highlighted, go up to background, and you can either change it by changing a color or you can insert an image for the background. Once you are finished with your slide and you want to add a new slide, all you have to do is go over to this empty space, right click, or if you're on a trackpad, um, just use two fingers and press new slide. Or say 
you want to duplicate this slide because your next slide is going to be very similar to it. Same thing, you go up, you right click, and you just press duplicate slide. Then say you end up not wanting that, so you want to delete that slide. Similar, you just go up, right click, and press delete. If you want to put a link in one of your slides, all you have to do is highlight where you want the link to be, and then go up to this button here and type in your link. So now when I present and I click right here, it will take me right to the CBU homepage. Now, if you wanted to add an audio file, a video file, an image, a table, or a chart, what you have to do is go up to insert and click which one you would like to add to your slide and upload if it's an image or a video or an audio file. One cool thing about Google Slides is that if you add a chart, let's say we add a pie chart, you can edit the data within the Google slide. What you gotta do is hit this arrow, click open source, and it takes you to an Excel file looking thing. To edit, all you do is make your edits within here. If I wanted to change the title, I can. And then once you're done making your edits, all you have to do is exit out, go back to your slide and hit update, and your changes would be made. Great thing about Google Slides is that it is very easy to collaborate with someone on a project. All you have to do is go up to the share button, and you can either add them to this project by um, their email, or you can send them a link which will give them access to the Google Slide. Now, a fun way to use Google Slides is to use it for games. If you search up on Google um, games for Google Slides, you can get these templates that people make for you to edit and use yourself. So for an example, I'm going to use Jeopardy. Eric Kurtz made this template, and so every slide is connected to each of these um, sections. So say someone picks inclusive education for $100. Click the $100 and it takes me right to the question. What does UDL stand for? If I click this button down here, it takes me straight to the answer, universal design for learning, and then I'm able to go right back to the Jeopardy board. For this, you would just have to keep score on the board or have a volunteer keep score. Thank you for listening and I hope this was helpful. All right. Good presentation there. Again, thank you to uh, my uh, participants from Group 1 from 4108 for sharing that video. Um, they have an example posted here of a, a Jamboard if you want to actually uh, uh, check it out. And some other Google Docs examples here. If you want to share some examples of how you, you you have used Google Docs in the past, then you can submit them using this assignment tool that is set up here. I'm going to jump right ahead now to uh, the presentation on Kahoot by Group Two, and this was by Michael and Brett from 4108. So we'll start off with their overview of Kahoot, and then they have another games, another chance for you guys to uh, to wake up a bit and uh, get interactive with things. All right, so uh, I think actually what I'm going to need to do instead of uh, sharing this this way, I'm going to need to actually share the uh, PowerPoint presentation from my uh, from my computer because they have some uh, some videos built into it. So this is their presentation here. And I will present that. Uh, all right, so they talk a little bit here about what Kahoot is. It is free. You can get a, a paid premium version of it. You can create your own games in Kahoot like the one we played earlier or you can find existing ones and copy them. The one we played earlier was actually an existing one that I made a copy of. 
It allows you to use uh, students to use their own devices and to participate in a fun game, and it also allows you to get some formative feedback on how your students are doing with the material. And here is a little walkthrough video that they have about. Will this actually work for us? There we go. A little walkthrough video about how to use Kahoot. One of, if not the most popular gamified platform out there for quizzes is Kahoot. Kahoot is a fun, engaging way that you can design, share, and easily implement games and gamified quizzes in your classroom. One of the nice things is that there's thousands upon thousands of pre-made Kahoots that educators have shared over the past few years that range across content areas and grade levels. Let's take a closer look at how you can design Apologies there. One of, if not the most popular. And this is the dashboard. And I know there's a lot here. So if you haven't used this much before, really the only place you have to take a look at the beginning uh, to get up and running is the create button up at the top right. So I'm going to click create. And I'm going to do new Kahoot. So just a quick overview of the layout. The left is how you build out your questions. It's kind of like a slide deck that you would build out uh, based on how many questions you want in this quiz. At the top is where you would type your question, and then you can set the time limit, point values, uh, answer selections, and then you can also add a resource to the question. Um, so I'm going to start out here at the top, typing in my question. I'll keep the time limit at 20 seconds, keep the point value the same, and then answer options. I'm just going to have a single answer to this question. Now here you can add images where you can upload your own from the image library, or you can actually add a YouTube link if you'd like it to play a video uh, before your question. So what I'm gonna do is click on upload image and then choose a file from my computer. And now at the bottom, I'm gonna choose a few different options for my students to answer this question. And then what you'll also do is click on this little icon here to choose the correct answer. Now, another option you have is instead of text or uh, numbers, you can actually add images as the answer. So a lot of different ways that that could be valuable, especially for younger students. But just know that if you wanted to insert an image, that's where you would do so. OK, so for the next question, I'm actually going to choose from the question bank just to show you guys how that looks. So I'll add in the question that I was thinking of just to see if it's already been made before, just to speed things up a bit. And you can see here that this question actually already comes up. So I'm going to add that in. I'll just double check that it's the correct answer. And now I have my sample Kahoot quiz. All right, the next step is clicking the done button, giving it a title. And now I have my Kahoot in my dashboard. Next step is how would I actually share this with students so that we can play a live game? So what I'll do is I'll launch this game and then have a separate browser window on the side of this one just so you can see what, what it looks like from the teacher standpoint as well as the student standpoint. All right, so this is my Kahoot. I can see my questions here. And on the left, you'll have the options on how you can actually get started and play. Once you click the play button, you have two options. You can either teach it live, and this could be for if you're doing a live class with students in front of you or for it's a live virtual class. The second one is a sign. That's where if you wanted to actually have this be a self-paced game where not everybody has to play at the same time, uh, but it would provide a link or a way for students to jump into the game, do it on their own, still get a score, but it wouldn't have to be in a live session. What I'll do is I'll demo the live classroom example. Now, once you have this dashboard come up, you have a few other game options. So on the left, it's just for every student if they had their own device. On the right would be if they were playing with teams. So we're going to keep the classic mode. There's also a few other game options at the bottom. Uh, this one is a friendly nickname generator that avoids inappropriate nicknames during the game. That, act that can happen, I know from experience. Uh, there's lobby music. You can turn that on or off. And then you also have some options regarding randomizing the order of the questions and the answers. Uh, and then some other advanced options towards the bottom uh, as far as rejoining uh, and then automatically moving through questions throughout the session. Now that my Kahoot is launched, uh, it's pretty simple to get your kids into the game. You just have them go to Kahoot.it, or if they have the Kahoot app, uh, they can open that, and then they would enter this game pin here. At this point, you'll also hear the Kahoot music. I adjusted the volume, uh, but this is what it would sound like. And then you would wait for your players in the bottom left there. And as your students join the class, uh, you would see them populate on the bottom right. 
Let's take a look at the right uh, screen because that's what I'm gonna use for the student demo. So students again would go to kahoot.it and then from here they would enter the game pin. At this point, you can see on the left side, you can, I see that Tom has joined the class. I'm also gonna join with another account just so I can have multiple players in this game. Okay, now you can see that I have two players in the game and I'm ready to launch the game. So I'll click on the start button. Now on the left, you'll see that the quiz has begun. It has the question. It gives kids a, a little bit of time to see it. And then on the right, the students would choose the color. So the answers are actually on the screen to the left. They're not on the student devices. So the student would try to match up what the correct answer is. You also see that the time's running down. So I'm gonna choose this answer here. And I can see that I got the answer correct and gives me a score. It also gives you more points based on how quickly you answer it correctly. After each question, you can show the students the scoreboard. Then we'll go to question two. How many branches are there of the federal government? And you can see that both of us got that one correct. And we finish with the podium and ceremony. Let me adjust the volume so you guys can hear the wonderful music. And that is how you launch and play a Kahoot with your class. So this is the screen that the teacher sees once you wrap up a game. If you click view full report, this will bring you to a uh, screen that shows the data that came from that assessment. Uh, so I didn't have a whole lot of data here because there weren't a lot of questions and there weren't a lot of players. Uh, but this is where you can go through and look at each player's answers, uh, the percentage correct. Uh, and then you could also do it by question. So for instance, question one, I would say, all right, 50% of the, the class got that wrong. Just a quick way to get a gauge of um, student proficiency or understanding or lack thereof. I'm just going to show you one more thing before we wrap up this Kahoot tutorial. At the top left, you're going to see a Discover section. There are actually a ton of pre-made Kahoots, so you can search right from this toolbar up at the top, but they also have collections. So for instance, Election Day, all of the uh, Kahoots that are related to the elections are going to be here. Um, but again, if you want to see all different collections and top picks, they have a bunch of them that are curated on the Kahoot platform. So again, you don't have to necessarily make these from scratch. If you find some out there that are helpful or that you want to just kind of edit and duplicate and change up and revise for your class, you can do that as well to save you some time. Okay, so nice little overview there. Let's move along to the next slide uh, here. So you can use it as an assessment tool, get some nice formative feedback there like they were mentioning in the video. Um, it's a fun way to engage your students in a quiz that's not actually a quiz. Uh, next slide. Although it's free, there are paid versions of it that allow you to do a lot more neat stuff. OK, so where's my Google Classroom gone? There we go. So if you want to uh, retry um, this game that we're going to play now in a second, there is a uh, free version or a self-paced version of it here. But I'm going to launch another Kahoot game for you all about the basics of Kahoot. So I will get into my Kahoot game here now. So it's the Kahoot intro quiz. And you can go to Kahoot.it to uh, get in here. And I will play this. I will use the teach option for it. I'll use the classic. And it will give you a pin code and you can get into the game. Looks like they're doing a bit of a demo video here at the beginning of this. And we've got a few people signed in already. Thank you. 
All right, we've got nine people in now so far, so I'm going to start the game. And remember, you'll be able to join even after the game has started. The pin code will show up. What is Kahoot? The correct answer is all of those. So everybody got points for that who answered. But our leader is again Tanya. Tanya fast off the draw. How can I join the Kahoot community? Yes, you can get a uh, free account at Kahoot.com and follow a few quick and easy steps. So the only incorrect answer there was a Skype interview with the CEO. Tanya still in the lead. I think Tanya must have some kind of cheat going on here. How do you start creating your first Kahoot? Yeah, everybody who answered gets points for that one. The only one that's incorrect is with butter and sugar. Tanya, you're on fire again. Yes, again, the only option here that's incorrect is paint the screen. Everybody gets points. Chelsea's on fire now with a streak of four questions. Tanya, way to go. Still in the lead. Everyone gets points again. Yeah, obviously you can't change its haircut. Tanya still maintaining the lead. Betty is on fire. Yes, all of those are correct. So everyone gets points this time. All of these answers are correct. Everyone gets points. Tanya still in the lead. What can you use the results for? Yes, all the answers are correct, except for assigning grades. You cannot assign grades in Kahoot. Tanya has fallen from the lead. Jess has taken the top spot. What does Kahoot offer you? Yes, it offers you all of those things. 
just maintaining the leaderboard, the lead on the leaderboard. Bit of a promotional question here by the looks of it. Yes, all of those answers are correct according to the game. Let's find out who our leaders are, our winners. Chelsea at number three. Leah at two. And Jess takes the win this time. Tanya and Megs as the runners up. All right, so that is uh, our little lesson about Kahoot. There's a self-paced version of that here if you'd like to check it out. I'm going to move along to Group 3's presentation on Nearpod, another useful interactive tool. Uh, so they have actually um, created a Nearpod presentation. I'll present it from here, but I believe that if you're in the Google Classroom, you can get into the Nearpod itself uh, use, uh, using the student link below uh, to participate in the live presentation. So uh, which one is the student link? This is the student link here. If you want to uh, participate in the presentation as a student, you click on that one and I will launch this Nearpod here now for us to interact with. Uh oh, coder link is no longer valid. Ah, because I'm not logged in. Probably why. Okay, so this would be the Nearpod Brunch and Learn here. I'm going to do this as a live presentation. And there's your code to join. So I'll give you a moment to join in there if you want to. All right, and we will now get into the presentation. Many of us probably had an education experience that looked something like this. But today's classroom looks and functions much differently than a classroom of just five years ago. The integration of technology and online learning has allowed teachers and students many more options when it comes to delivering and learning course materials. But with all of these additional resources available, it can make the process of effectively integrating technology into your lesson plans feel often overwhelming and cumbersome. But with Nearpod, teachers can combine digital resources and create interactive lesson plans that are all housed in one location, making it easy for students to navigate and access course materials. With its user-friendly interface, teachers can easily convert previous PowerPoint presentations and integrate them with a variety of additional content and activities. Use drag and drop activities to label diagrams, images, maps, patterns, cycles, and more. Open-ended questions allow students to respond with text of up to a thousand characters, record audio, and access additional reference material. Fill in the blank activities allow students to complete a passage and populate blanks with pre-given words. 
Poll activities allow teachers to ask multiple choice questions to check for understanding. They could also take a class vote, highlight student opinions, and more. And the draw activity allows students to respond to a prompt with drawings, texts, and images. You could upload a background image and have students draw on top of it. Now let's have a look at some of the assessment tools that are built into Nearpod. Okay, next slide here. Oh, that looks like the same video. Many of us. With Nearpod's variety of formative assessments, you can gauge a student's understanding of your lesson in real time and even automate lesson grading. Let's take a look at some examples. Drawings are like interactive whiteboards. Students can draw, highlight, type, and add pictures. You can upload an existing file or start from scratch. Drawings can be used to solve equations, annotate passages, label diagrams, and much more. With open-ended questions, students can explain their thinking or get creative. Teachers are able to share responses with the class anonymously to highlight strong answers or tackle misconceptions without putting anyone on the spot. All responses are logged in post-session reports. Use a poll to highlight student opinions, collect information, check for overall class understanding, or as a springboard for a class discussion, share anonymous responses with the class in the form of a pie chart. With Collaborate Boards, you can create collaborative learning opportunities where students share their ideas in real time. Students can post text and images and even like each other's posts. You can choose to approve posts before they appear on the board. Fill in the blanks is a drag and drop activity for a quick check on vocabulary or a fast review of a concept. It's an easy and fun way for students to gauge their own understanding and a favorite of English language learners. Make your classroom more accessible for visual learners with matching pairs. Let students test their knowledge by matching pictures and or text. Matching pairs is great for vocabulary, math, science, almost any subject. Gamify the whole experience with the timer option. Eliminate the headache of manually grading exit tickets and tests. With quizzes, you can assess students understanding through multiple choice or true false questions, receive instant results and identify common misconceptions. Get 100% student participation, instant feedback, auto-graded results, and an engaged classroom. It's all possible with Nearpod. So, let's transform teaching together. Next, let's have a look at how we can use the Nearpod website to search for pre-existing lesson plans. Today, we will learn how to search the Nearpod library for lessons and videos. Once in your Nearpod account, select Nearpod Library in the gray panel on the left-hand side. You will be defaulted to our home Nearpod Library page. Here, you will see a rotating banner of new features and content we've created for you to enjoy. Underneath, you will see folders with featured lessons, lessons by publishers, videos, and premium packages. The second way you can search the Nearpod library is using a search engine. I can search and filter the Nearpod library by typing in any key term, such as fractions. You can see here we have a variety of K through 12th grade standards aligned lessons and videos for you to choose from and add to your library. 
The third way to filter your Nearpod library is using the gray panel to the left-hand side. Here, you can filter by lessons or by videos. Lastly, you can search the Nearpod library by standard. First, begin by seeing the state in which you teach in. Then, select the subject, the grade level, and the specific strand. If you have any further questions, please visit nearpod.com forward slash resources or email us at support at nearpod.com. Hello, everyone. Next, we'll be going over a Nearpod example lesson. So please go to the following web address on your device if you'd like to participate in the example lesson. The web address is https colon backslash backslash nearpod.com backslash library backslash. And next, please enter the lesson code in the top left of your screen, uh, which can be seen on in the image on the right as well. So that's the code that's showing up here in the top. A couple of seconds and then we will move on to the example lesson. So this would be the example lesson, which is on plants and the code is up here if you do want to get into Nearpod and join. In this example, we'll be focusing on a grade three science class. We'll be looking at life science and with a specific focus on plants. Next slide. So what will we be learning in this example lesson? Uh, we'll be learning how plants are important to humans. And we'll move on to the next slide. So a chance for some of you who are logged in to participate here. What are some reasons you think plants are important to humans? OK, so we do have some answers here. And we've got one more participant who's still answering. Okay, well, I'm not sure if Maggie is going to uh, be able to finish answering. Let's move on to the next part in this lesson. Plants and humans. We will focus on four main categories where plants are important to humans. Number one, food. Number two, oxygen, number three, products, and number four, erosion protection. Next slide. Taking a while to load this one. Okay, not sure what's going on with that one, so I'll move on to the next slide. So another activity here. Oh, we didn't get to see the video. It looks like we're getting some incorrect answers here because uh, because we didn't get to see the video. Now we're getting some correct ones coming through now. I like the little uh, gauge they're showing you uh, graphically, the percentage correct and incorrect. All right, so another video. Plants and food. Plants supply food to many living organisms, including humans. Before permanent settlements, 
humans use to gather plants in the wild for food. On the next slide, we'll be using a collaborative board to share our thoughts. Please post your answers to the question on the next slide. Again, it's taking a while to load here. Ah, uh, could not get to this one. Okay. Plants and oxygen. Plants produce oxygen, which humans need to breathe. Plants also turn the carbon dioxide that humans exhale into oxygen again. Next slide. Plants and products. Plants can be used to create many products that are useful to humans. Many medicines are made from plants. For example, the juice from aloe plants can help heal sunburns. Plants, like trees, can be used to make timber used for building houses. Plant juices can be used as dyes to color things. For example, blueberry juice can be used as a blue dye. Plant fibers can also be used to make products such as paper. Next slide. Okay, for the purposes of time, because we're getting to the top of the hour here, I'm going to move on along and skip the rest of the activities in here. Uh, there was only a couple left, but you get a gist for how Nearpod can work. And again, there is, uh, you can get into these examples from on here, and there is. Um, a chance to review this Nearpod presentation on your own time. So group four uh, has a presentation on Padlet. They did have some breakout activities planned, but I think that uh, we may end up skipping that for time's sake because we have 30 minutes left and we've got two more topics to get through. And I do want to save a few minutes at the end in case anybody has any questions. So group four, that was Matt and Nathan, and are gonna, they're going to give us an introduction to Padlet. Padlet is a digital pin board that lets you gather a variety of objects such as text posts, pictures, video clips, audio files, web links, and many more. The essence of a Padlet is to provide a place from where people can work on a project in a fun, easy, and interactive way. You can start using Padlet by signing up for a free account. The website can be accessed at www.padlet.com. You can also search Padlet to download the Android and iOS app to get started. Once you're logged in, you can create a new wall. Here's a sample of Padlet's beginning. On a Padlet, you can simply click this plus icon or double click to add a link to an image you have found online or you can upload a photo of your own, add pros, poems, videos, or other notes related to the topic. The toolbar at the top provides additional options to customize your Padlet's title, layout, description, and privacy settings. Help information can also be accessed here. For every Padlet created, there's a link which you can share with others so you can work together. sample of a Padlet created by one user. You can visit the website's gallery at padlet.com slash about slash gallery for more inspiration. We hope you enjoy using Padlet. Okay, so a quick intro there to Padlet. There is a, another video that's posted here uh, that I've added uh, from Richard Byrne, who's an EdTech guru. Uh, it's a bit of a longer video, but it gives you more background on how to get started with Padlet. I'll save that for you to review on your own time if you'd like to learn a little bit more. Now, um, Group 4 has created an example. They did have a, a breakout activity based on this example, but I'll show you what it is. I think we'll skip the actual breakout activity just for time purposes so we can get through the remaining topics. 
But their example of a Padlet board was to use it in a Canadian history class to create a timeline from Confederation until today. So if I launch this, it will show you what this looks like. Uh, so different groups of students in this activity, you would assign each group of students one decade and they would have to post uh, so a summary of some of the big things that happened during that particular decade and you create your timeline co-created as a class that way. So they did have a blank one of these set up, uh, but for time purposes, I think that I will skip that for now, but looks like an interesting use of it. Uh, I had another example of it uh, here myself. Um, this is one that I've used in breakout activities with a graduate student class, uh, Masters of Education students, who are looking at social learning theories. So I created one of these boards, a separate board for each of the breakout rooms. And in this one, I posted a couple of prompts uh, to do during their uh, their evening class. So they had to uh, look at some resources and then share their thoughts on here. So you can see that they did end up sharing some thoughts. And I also gave them some work to collaborate on throughout the rest of the week. Um, and uh, to share those results on here. So they did actually post some results on here as well and do some connections between it. So that's another way that you could use a Padlet wall. And I have a third example here. This is one that, uh, that uh, the students in 4108 actually participated in during our first week of class. A little bit of an icebreaker activity. What would your pet say? And I've uh, this wall is open if any of you want to check it out later on and add your own memes to it. Then you can feel free to do that. But basically it was a way for us to all introduce each other. I gave them all a few minutes to come up with their own graphic, their own little meme as to what their pet real or imagined would say if they could speak what they would say about them and then i gave everybody a chance to uh, to further introduce themselves and, and explain their meme to the rest of the class so a nice little uh, icebreaker activity especially in a virtual setting uh, so you can check that out on the google classroom i believe i've also put a link to that one in teams uh, if you want to check it out and our last topic on here, oh, I didn't have my camera on. Our last topic on here is uh, digital accessibility basics, and I'm going to cover some of the things that you can do uh, with materials that you're creating and sharing with your students to make sure that, uh, that they're as accessible as possible. And time permitting, I'll show you a little bit about using tools, uh, screen reader applications that some of your students might be using. So I do have a PowerPoint presentation here. You can get that slide deck, but what I think I will do is actually, um, this one is using assistive technology. I have that open here. I'll go right to the beginning and I'll just present it from my screen here. It will uh, work a little bit better. So this is based off of a presentation that myself and uh, Dr. Sandra Jack Malik gave for Dyslexia Canada. Uh, a few months back and I've uh, tweaked it a little bit for our purposes here today. So again, we've already done the land acknowledgement, so I will uh, skip past that slide for now. Uh, this is a, a screenshot that I took of, um, of something that I came across earlier in the term for my 4108 students. Ta and it really illustrates the importance of keeping digital accessibility in mind when you're creating resources for your students. So what was I saying about the world not being designed for the disabled? I can't turn my head. How am I supposed to get back into my account? Because they want you to take a video selfie. Not everything digital that you come across is going to be accessible to all of your students. In some cases, it might actually cause more headaches for them then it's worth you might get into some issues. So my perspective on this uh, when I talk about digital accessibility, it's a bit of a passion of mine. I try to work it into all of my technology courses in some way, shape or form. I come at this from a few different perspectives. The first is as um, as uh, a parent. I have three children. 
two of whom have diagnosed disabilities and one who has some uh, some other physical ailments that she's dealing with, but they haven't actually been classified as a disability at this point. Second, I come at this from the perspective of an educator uh, and someone who has some experience working with students who have uh, disabilities. And the third perspective I come at this from is as an instructional designer. I have a number of years of experience working exclusively in the instructional design field, and uh, I know quite a few of the tricks of the trade and uh, some of the requirements uh, that are in place in different jurisdictions across Canada. So, like I said, I have two children who have disabilities. One, my, uh, my eldest, my daughter, uh, she's 14, she has dyslexia. My son has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which causes uh, some unique issues for him. One is that he's often very tired. He gets tired very easily. Uh, he's at risk for um, suffering from muscle degradation and uh, serious consequences if he gets a muscle injury. The other one is that um, it's accompanied by selective mutism. So he's... Uh, He's often very quiet in the class. He has difficulty speaking with adult figures in the school, and that can cause some issues that you might imagine when working with teachers or with his TA. The reasons why you want to leverage technology for inclusivity, uh, I have personal reasons. You you know, the, the unique needs of your children. Uh, there are financial, socioeconomic reasons why you want to leverage technology and keep inclusivity in mind when you're using technology. Some students may not have access to all the technologies that, uh, that you want to use. Uh, some of their parents may not have it. Some school districts may not have access to it. So you want to keep some basic principles in mind when choosing the technologies that you're going to use. And there's also multicultural reasons why um, if you choose your technologies wisely and keep uh, inclusivity in mind then you're not going to inadvertently exclude any of your students whether it be for a diagnosed disability for socioeconomic reasons or for cultural reasons i like to always share this uh, this little graphic as well i came across this one a few years back it's about 20 years old now it's kind of like a Gary Larson type cartoon. It shows a gentleman sweeping the snow off the steps at the school and the little fella in the wheelchair is asking if he can shovel the ramp first. He says that he'll get to it once he gets the steps for everybody else. And the, uh, the kid in the wheelchair points out, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So, one of the fears that I've come across from uh, people that I've worked with in the past, from teachers I've worked with, is that needing to accommodate students with disabilities, needing to uh, incorporate inclusivity and uh, accessibility into the design of your materials is just adding extra work on top of things for you, and you may not have the time for it. But if you design with these things in mind, you're not wasting your time because it accommodates everyone. Everyone can still access. So you focus on making sure that uh, that you're accommodating these things and you're not actually adding extra time in. And some of the uh, some of the little tricks that I'm going to show you today don't actually take you any extra time, but they'll save you a heck of a lot of time down the road if you need to remediate something. And uh, if you encounter a student who has a particular disability or a particular accessibility issue. You might uh, come across these particular terms when um, when you're in the classroom. You might have come across them already in some of your courses. The difference between accommodations and modifications. Wherever possible, you want to work with accommodations as opposed to modifications. Accommodations mean that you're simply adding extra pathways into um, the existing curriculum for your students. You're not changing anything about the curriculum, but you're adding some extra pathways in, making it easier for them to get in through the door and be in with everybody else. When you're talking about modifications, you're talking about creating two separate 
uh, two separate pathways, a separate room, a separate uh, way to get into the curriculum and maybe even a slightly different curriculum for a particular student. So if you come across these terms when you're talking uh, with parents, when you're talking with your students or talking with your teams at your schools, that's the difference between them. Uh, accommodations, you're not actually changing the curriculum for students, you're just making it easier for them to get in through the door. And so we'll focus on some accommodations here right now. Uh, you also want to keep your students' perspectives in mind when you're talking about leveraging technology for inclusivity. Just because a technology exists doesn't mean that it's a useful technology. This is one particular uh, tool that was introduced on the market a year or two ago, a couple of years back now. It's a uh, voice muffler and Somebody suggested it to me a couple of years back. Like, oh, your daughter has dyslexia. You know, uh, maybe she wants to use Google Read and Write with her Chromebook in class, and she could use something like this so that she could just talk to her computer and and uh, she won't disrupt the rest of the class. If you were a fourteen year old girl at Sydney Academy right now, would you want to be wearing this thing on your face in class? This is just going to draw more attention to yourself. It's going to make you feel really anxious and uneasy. It's not a suitable alternative. Now imagine using this for my son, who uh, also leverages his Chromebook quite a bit because it's difficult for him to use a pen and to write everything all day. He has social anxiety issues, selective mutism. He doesn't want to talk in front of the class. With his social anxiety, can you imagine him wanting to use one of these? So just because a tool is out there doesn't necessarily mean it's a good option. You need to consider the context. You need to consider your students' perspectives as well. Um, I like to think of leveraging technology as an episode of the Magic School Bus. It opens up a lot of possibilities for students to do things that uh, they normally wouldn't be able to do um, with traditional resources. And opening pathways for all your students makes it more engaging and more exciting. So that's why I included that slide uh, previously. Uh, back to that slide again. I like to also include a range of options. I don't like to focus on on including technology in my course designs as remediation for uh, accessibility issues. I like to provide a range of options for everybody to leverage, and some of those options might be more appealing to uh, to some students than others based on their particular needs, their particular interests. So if you accommodate a range of options, for your students to uh, to interact with the material or to create uh, content to submit back to you, then you may eliminate uh, some of the barriers that students with accessibility issues may have to begin with. All right, so uh, let's look at some tools now for actually en um, engaging with materials and listening to the materials. Um, I have uh, some resources that I can share with all of you. They're available on my website, but I believe I've put these into the Google Classroom as well on how to promote inclusivity with technology. One of these is my digital accessibility cheat sheet. Feel free to take a copy of that for yourselves, print it off and leverage it with all of the resources that you produce. The uh, the cheats that I have on here apply whether you're producing a document with Microsoft Word, whether you're creating a PowerPoint, a Google Classroom, a website, a video, all of these same cheats apply and they're very easy fixes that you're able to focus on. Um, not going to focus on uh, finding, uh, curating some of the materials too much, but you do want to make sure that you're providing some low tech alternatives, some some print based alternatives, not just interactive media at all times. Some of your students uh, may not have access to uh, bandwidth at home. They might not have Internet access. They might not even have devices at home. So always provide low tech alternatives as well as your high tech alternatives. If you're going to leverage technology, don't reinvent the wheel. You don't need to necessarily create your own instructional videos if they already exist. For example, you don't need to create your own Kahoot uh, games or your own Nearpods if they already exist and cover that topic. Just uh, preview them, make sure they meet your needs and use them. And of course, you can pre-record new materials. 
I don't recommend, especially working with uh, with large groups of students that you spend an entire two or three hours lecturing. I recommend pre recording materials to share with your students because they can watch it at their own time. You may miss critical points and want to review them from a live lecture, but if it's pre recorded, you can watch it in small chunks at your own leisure. You can rewind. Um, and you can spend that quality time that you have together with your students that live time interacting with them, getting them to apply the materials or answering questions that they may have. Uh, for communicating with your students, you want to be as inclusive as possible there. Uh, provide some printable materials if you're teaching remotely that you can mail out if necessary, if some of your students don't have internet access. Share a, a phone number or a Google chat link or some other uh, way that uh, they can connect with you in real time outside of class um, and make sure you let them know when you're actually available so that they're not basically hounding you 24 hours a day and use your live on time collaboratively wherever possible. When it comes to your assessments, be as flexible as possible with your uh, with your assessments. Have multiple ways for your students to complete and submit their work. Uh, leverage tech, uh, technology to do that, and you're going to be as, in, uh, as accommodating and inclusive as possible. Uh, focus on authentic problem based activities, uh, learning assessments as opposed to uh, to using straight multiple choice tests or, or written tests. Be as authentic as possible. It increases engagement and gets more of your students involved in it. And be as flexible as possible with timelines within reason with the, the requirements uh, for uh, submitting work, uh, submitting grades to your school. Uh, OK, so let's look at some examples of how to um, how to create your materials and be as, as as accessible as possible with that. The cheat sheet summarizes these. I can show you a couple of examples now of how to uh, how to work this in Microsoft Word. Um, you want to make sure that you're focusing on using actual heading structures in your documents, not just manually formatting your headings. When you're working with images, make sure you have all text on them. Mark them as uh, as decorative. If they are decorative, do not include a lot of text within an image. It's not readable, so any of your visually impaired students won't be able to access that text. And um, make sure that uh, you're using good use of color. Don't use color for emphasis. Make sure you have a strong contrast. Black on white always works best. If you're curating videos for your students or creating your own, make sure that they have closed captions available. Easy things to do up front, more difficult for you to do later on. Uh, so this is just a summary of some of those key points in here. Again, here's an example of what happens. Uh, there's a few issues with this particular screenshot. This is an email that I got from the university last year. I have my phones <coughs> set to dark mode. Uh, so this particular email, all of the text that's in here is text within an image. The image itself is a transparent image, so it picked up the black coming through. They have black text uh, in a transparent image. Because it is black text and I have uh, dark mode turned on on my phone, I can't read the text. It's black text on a black background. So it's incredibly difficult uh, to read visually on my screen. Some of your students may choose to have dark mode on because they just find it more comfortable. Others may choose to have it on because they have a visual impairment and it's easier for them to read white text on a black background, but it, it's almost impossible for them to read this example. And because it's an image, they can't use Google Read and Write or any of the other screen reader applications to read it to them. So keep that in mind. Don't embed a lot of text as images and be careful with the colors that you're choosing. Make sure that there's a nice high color contrast ratio. So here you can see a close up of my good and my bad example there. It's very difficult to read that blue, uh, that light blue text on that yellow background. Uh, but it's very easy to read the text, uh, the dark text, the black text on a white background. All right, so let's look at a how to demonstration here uh, of a couple of different things and I'll come back to the slides in a minute. I had some examples in here um, that we can uh, look at. 
So this is an example of an unformatted Word document that I have. It's an old paper that I wrote many years ago and um, I wasn't so savvy on digital accessibility issues at the time. And there's a number of issues with this one. First, my title here, you can see from the styles toolbar, it's normal text. I've just made it really big and bold and changed the font for it. And this here, I've done the same thing as normal text. What happens when I do this? If one of my students is using Google Read and Write or is using the uh, speech to text features within Microsoft Word because they have a visual impairment, they can't navigate this document. They have to get the uh, Read and Write to read the entire document to them to find where they left off if it's a longer document. If instead I use my title, my toolbar up here, my styles toolbar, change that to a title and change this to heading one and I go throughout my document and I change all of this stuff to proper heading levels based on the headings that uh, that they actually are. This one is heading level two already. I can, in theory, what this was originally designed for, I will add a table of contents right here using my, uh, I believe it is under references, table of contents, I'll just add an automatic one in. You see now it picks up all everything that I have tagged as a heading and creates a table of contents. Digital screen reader applications like Read and Write leverage the same technology and you can use your keyboard or digital switch to navigate from heading to heading to heading. You find, oh, I want to read the introduction. You uh, you let go of the, uh, the switch, the toggle, and it reads this section out to you. So I can navigate to one of these different sections even if I'm visually impaired. So always use these formatting styles up here rather than manually setting up your headings by just making them bold and big. It takes you a few seconds to do, makes it easier for you to create a table of contents, and it makes it accessible to students who have a visual impairment. Next issue that I have with this here is an issue with graphics. This table here is text within an image. It's not machine readable. Read and write can't read it out to them. I also have an, uh, an issue here that I do not have alt text on this. Actually, I do have alt text on this one. Uh, alt text, if you're using read and write and you get past this paragraph, you get to the text, read and write is going to read out the alt text to your students, the alternate text. So it'll tell them what's in the picture. But this is still not a good option because it's got a lot of text in here. You want to avoid lots of text in there. If you have an image, though, that is, let's say that it's a decorative image. Let's say this one was decorative. It wasn't actually um, an instructional content image. I could mark it as decorative, and a screen reader application will skip that image when it's reading through the document. You won't confuse your, your users. So a couple of quick, easy fixes there for any document. You can do the same stuff in PowerPoint. You can do the same stuff when you're using a learning management system and creating your pages, and you'll make it much easier to work with. You also want to make sure that you're not taking your text and making the text blue or anything like that for emphasis because the color contrast ratio is going to be too low. I'll show you an example of a little tool that I have here that tests that. I have too many tabs open. I have a tool called the Color Contrast Analyzer. It's a free tool. Link is in the PowerPoint slides, which are available in Google Classroom. Just give it a moment to load up here. And what it's going to do is it's going to show me whether this passes WCAG uh, accessibility guidelines from the World Wide Web Consortium. Black and white text, which this is set to right now, has a 21, point, uh, 21 to 1 contrast ratio. It passes all levels of accessibility. but if I take my dropper and pick this blue color here, get steady on that, and I pick the white for the background, you can see that it's failing. It's not a high enough contrast ratio for visually impaired students to be able to read that. So you want to you want to make sure that you're sticking to black and white wherever possible. All right, where were we with the slides? Uh, tools for reading and writing. 
Uh, we are getting close to the end of the time here now, but I'll just review a couple of these tools for you. Uh, there are tools that you can use for consuming information and tools that you can use for creating information. So if you want to, uh, to consume information, you can use tools to, uh, to do what we call ear reading or listening to the content. Read and write's an example of that. The options built into Microsoft Word are an, are an option for that. There's other options available online that let you consume some of those tools or some of that content. And we'll take a look at that now. So some different tools for ear reading. Uh, you can use audio books for that. Um, you can use text to speech applications. Google Read and Write is one. I don't actually have a Google Read and Write account installed on my version of Chrome here right now. So I can't demonstrate that one to you, but I can demonstrate Immersive Reader in Microsoft Word and it works pretty much the same. Uh, there's also read aloud options available for uh, Office 365. Uh, that's the one I'm going to demonstrate to you now. There's Office Lens available for Android devices. There's uh, accessibility features on different devices. So I'll show you what those look like now. Uh, do a little demonstration of that. I'll come back into my document here, go to the beginning. And I will turn on the accessibility tools for that, which are where on this one. Where is my accessibility on this one? It's been a while since I used it. View, no, it's not under there. Where do I get the immersive, uh, the read aloud on this? There we go, read aloud, it's under the review. So if I turn on read aloud. Collaborative situated active mobile, CSAM, learning strategies, a new perspective on effective mobile learning. Contents. Introduction to. Collaborative situated. So it will read out the text to you and following the tips that I showed you earlier lets them easily navigate it. There's also a check your accessibility tool built in here. Read and write works essentially the same way in, um, in uh, Google Docs. I'll show you another tool in here now for production of material. I'm going to create a new blank document. And um, all right, I don't see dictate up here automatically. Where is the dictate tool on this? Of course, it's not going to show up for me right now. Of course, Dictate's not going to show up. On uh, my computer at home, when I'm looking at Microsoft Word, I have a little microphone right here, which lets me read out uh, what I want to insert in here. Insert, not showing up on this. Uh, so I have to apologize on that, but it's not showing up on here. Um, okay, I'll have to skip that one for you, but there is a way that you can just press the icon here. It lets you speak out what you want inserted. And yeah. And I see that we're getting right to the bottom of the hour, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, I have some more resources in here the, in the Google Classroom that will show you how to um, use different fonts for your screen, like open dyslexic font, uh, how to use color overlays. Uh, if, you're, if you have dyslexic students who are having issues reading what's on the screen, how to use things like um, the uh, read and write, the dictate, it's really easy to use. All you need to do is click on that little microphone and it lets you dictate it. Let's see if I can quickly get into Google Drive here and uh, show you how to do that in a new Google Doc. 
new Google Doc. All right, so I'm in Google Doc. I am going to go to my tools and turn on my accessibility tools. So turn on that support. And now I am going to, uh, let's see, accessibility, speak. Da, 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 da. Where is it? This is all for reading it out to you. Yeah, I don't have read and write built in here now, so I can't insert it using uh, using my mic right off the bat. You'd need to have read and write, and there's some other free stuff, uh, free plugins that you can turn on to do that. But since we're at 1130, and that's all the time that I had scheduled for you, I don't want to keep you any longer with that. Uh, I'll just quickly go back to the classroom here, show you that uh, I have a link here for some additional resources, including on my website where you can get a lot of the resources I looked at today uh, and more. The digital accessibility cheat sheet is there if you wanted an image version of it and a fully accessible PDF version. Um, and there is a PDF here as well with all of the different tools that I mentioned in this PowerPoint. Uh, tools for ear reading, uh, tools for production of uh, content, and all of the, the references as well. So all of that is there for you uh, in the Google Classroom, easy for you to access. Uh, to access. OK, so. Stop sharing my screen and open up the floor quickly for any questions you might have, recognizing that some of you may have to duck out now that we are at 1130. You might have another class or you want to get to some lunch. You're tired of listening to me, but the floor is yours if you have any questions. And again, a huge shout out to anyone who may be logged in here from 4108 who helped out with the production of the materials for today's session. By the way, I will uh, download this recording. I'll put it up on my YouTube channel and I'll send the link to Robin so that she can send it along to everyone to uh, review the presentation if they want to later. Anybody have any questions? Or did I bore you all to sleep? You didn't bore us at all. I just want to say thank you so much for taking your time to give us this presentation. You are more than welcome. It's my pleasure. I just wish we had more time so that we could actually engage in some of the interactive uh, activities that were planned. But c'est la vie, it's always best when you're running, uh, especially an online class um, or a class with younger kids, it's always best to have more materials prepared than what you actually need than to run out of time and be trying to figure out what to do with your students. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are just past 1130 now, so I'm going to stop the recording. And it's not letting me stop it from up there. There we go. Stop recording. <laughs>